Welcome to part two of our selection programming series. And in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at multiple conditions. What happens if we've got more than one question to ask? So let's get into it. So we, in the last lesson, learned about an if statement. And then if you've got a condition, then it will do the following statements if that condition is true. Now, what happens if you've got more than one condition that you need to meet? Well, in that case, we can use operators that can join conditions together. And so the first one we're going to learn about is the AND operator. So you can take two conditions and you can put them between an AND. Actually, you can put multiple conditions between the AND. Like it will scale up for three, four, five, six, as many conditions as you want. So you can have multiple ANDs with conditions on either side of them. So you can do that. Now, what does an AND do? Well, the rule of the AND is... All the conditions must be true for the whole thing to be true. So for those two statements to be executed, that if statement needs to send back a true. And the only way it'll send back a true is if every single one of those conditions are true. So let's have a look at this using the truth table. So if condition one and condition two are true, then obviously it meets the criteria of an and. Therefore, the, any result will be a true. Remember, all the conditions must be true for an and. But if condition 2 is false, then it will send back, even though condition 1 is true, it will send back a false because both of them must be true. But what about if condition 1 is false, but condition 2 is true? No, remember the rule is both conditions must be true for the whole thing to be true. So that will send back a false. And obviously if both of them are false, it will definitely be false because there's nothing true there. Okay, so that's an AND operator. Now there's also an OR operator. The OR operator works like an AND, except for the rule for an OR operator is at least one of the conditions must be true for the whole thing to be true. As long as one of them is true, the whole thing will be true. So you can have lots of ORs. As long as one of them is true, the whole thing will be considered true. So let's do the truth table. If both conditions are true, then definitely one of them, at least one of them is definitely true. So it will be a true. But if condition 1 is true and condition 2 is false, well, one of them is true, so that's enough. So it'll be true. And if condition 2 is true, but condition 1 is false, it doesn't matter. There's at least one true, so the whole thing will be true. But if both are false, well, then there's no true there, so therefore that will send back a false. Okay, so that's how an OR operator works. Okay, there's also a NOT operator. This is taking one condition. And what that does is it returns the opposite of the condition. So it will send back a, um, if the, the condition's true, it'll convert it to a false. And if it's false, it'll convert it to a true. So if it's true, it'll convert it to false. And if it's false, it'll convert it to a true. So that's how the not operator works. Now, whenever we have these conditions and we have the or and and operator, I want you, there's a special rule that needs to be applied. And that rule is, there must be brackets around your conditions. If you don't have brackets, it's going to give you a syntax error. So wherever you have your conditions, you must put brackets around them if you use the AND and the OR. Same goes with the AND. So you must make sure that you use brackets around your conditions whenever you use these operators. Now, I want to use an example. Sometimes in mathematics, you might see something like this. And that basically means that our num must be between 10 and 20. 20 inclusive. Inclusive meaning including 10 and 20. Those are possible options. And we tend to say it like that. Our number must be between 10 and 20. It must be bigger than 10. It must be smaller than equal to, it must be greater than or equal to 10, um, but less than or equal to 20. And we say it like that. And so we think because we say it like that, that's how we do it in Delphi. We think, oh, well, if our number is greater than or equal to 10 and it's less than or equal to 20, then we, we think that's okay. That's not okay. That is incorrect. That second condition is not a valid condition. If I look at that second condition by itself, less than or equal to 20, I can't say if it's true or false because I don't know what it's comparing it to be less than or equal to 20. You must write it out in full with a variable or value with operator and a variable and valuable. So it must look something like that. Even though you're using the same variable, you must say our num is greater than or equal to 10 and our num is less than or equal to 20 if you have that situation. Let's look at how that works now in Delphi. Yeah, we've got a program. You'll see there are two edit boxes. There's edit box well, edt num1 and edt num2. And so we're going to use multiple conditions. We're just using these two edit boxes. So if I click on this button, we're going to say if our num1 is bigger than 50 and our num2 is bigger than 50. If they're both bigger than 50, 
you see the and, they both must be true, then it'll only display the pass. If one of them is false, it'll be a fail. Let's see how that works. So we're looking at these two variables. So rnum1 is going to be above 50 and rnum2 will be above 50. So therefore, it will display pass and it will skip the fail part. But if one of them is incorrect, you see how 45, that is below 50. Even though the 89 is above 50, even though it's the one condition is true, it doesn't matter. Both must be true for it to pass. Okay, so that's why I displayed the fail. So remember with and, both of these must be true. And there you see, remember, it must have brackets around your conditions, your cute little brackets. Now, if we change this to an or, that means either one can be true. So if we run it now, Obviously, that scenario will be correct because both of them are true. So that still works fine. But if one of them goes below 50, as long as one of that, that one's still true. So therefore, this whole thing will still be true because all means as long as one of them is true, it'll be fine. But if both of them are below 50, now they're both false. Now it will display a false. Okay, so that's the all. And basically, the, the not, a lot of people get confused about the not. So you could say if, let's say if our num is greater than 50, and you want a scenario like that, um, you could, our num one, uh, you could, if you wanted not, for our num not to be greater than 50, you could say if our num is not greater than 50. So you could do something like that. But that would be the same as saying if, uh, num1 is less than equal to 50. Those two uh, conditions are exactly the same. Or you could say if uh, num equals to 10, uh, num1, sorry, uh, num2 is equal to 10, but you don't want it to equal to 10. So you could say if uh, num is not equal to 10, so you could do something like that as well. But again, you could also do it if our num2 is not shine bright like a diamond. Remember that? Not equal to 10. Then. So those are your equivalent set. But you can do either one of those. So you, that's, that's a way to use the not. If the, if the condition is too complicated to write like this, then you can just put the not in. So that's how you do an and, an or, and a not. Now, you can also make use of sets in Delphi when you want to check lots of options. And for example, let's take the scenario where we want to check someone's grade. And so we say if the grade, if they're in high school, if I grade is an 8 or if it's a 9 or it's a 10 or it's 11 or if it's 12, yo, that's a lot of uh, conditions there and a lot of or that, that's quite tedious to type out. Imagine if it was a number from 1 to 100, that would be quite complicated. So if we've got a set of numbers that we want to compare, I grade. We want to say if I grade is one of those numbers. Instead of it doing that way, you can do it using a set. Now, a set works like this. You have the variable that you're comparing, and then you use the in operator, and then in square brackets, you give all the set of options for um, that, are, that, are, that are possible for this to be true. So what will happen is the variable will then go check. Is the variable one of the options in the set? And if it is, that whole thing will be sent back as a true if that variable is not in the set of options it'll send back a false so what does that mean well let's use an example so just to, before i get to the example just a little rule about that variable that variable that you use with an n operator it must be an ordinal type of variable now, mr long what's an ordinal type well ordinal sounds like the word order so that means that the variable must have an order to it. Now, variables that have an order to it means that if I give you a value for that variable, you can easily tell me what the next and previous value will be. For example, if I give you the number 5, you know exactly that the next integer value, if it's an integer, for example, the next value is going to be a 6, and the number before 5 will be a 4. So that is an ordinal type. That's an integer. It's got order. But a real variable, that's not ordinal. Because if I give you the real 5, you don't know what the next value after 5 is going to be. Is it going to be 5.1? Is it going to be 5.01? Is it going to be 5. No, 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 You don't know. So there's no order to real numbers. So an integer is an example of an ordinal type. Another type of variable called a char is just, it's like a string, but it's just one character. 
Um, so you can tell an order of a one character. If I give you the letter D, you know that the next letter is going to be an E and the letter before the D would be C. So there's an order to that particular character. So those are two examples of ordinal types. So let's do some proper examples. So there we can say, instead of doing that big if step in the top, we could do it like this. If our grade, that's the variable we're looking for, in operator, and then our set is 8 dot dot 12. All the values from 8 to 12, including those. And you can see that they are in square brackets. Yes, square brackets. So there's an example of a set. Okay, so let's do some other examples. So let's say this. If our num is in 1 to 6, that could be for like a dice. So those are all the values from 1 to 6. So that's a nice little set that we've got there. What happens if we've got a break in our numbers? So you can say if our num is from 1 to 5, comma, or from 10 to 20. So you can separate um, ones that aren't in a particular order by a comma. So you can say a 1 to 5 or 10 to 20. If it's in, in that set, so if it's a 4, it's a true. If it's a 15, it's true because that value is a part of those sets. Another potential set could be from 0 to 255. Now this is a very special set because this one's showing you this is the biggest set you can have with an integer. The smallest value, lowest value that you can have in a set with an integer is a 0 and the highest value you can have is a 255. So make sure that if you're using sets, you don't go below zero with your options and you don't go above 255, um, 255 with your um, options. Okay, so just remember that with the integers. And let's look at some char options. If C letter is a character, we want it to be a letter from A to F. So A, B, C, D, E, or F. If it's one of those letters, it will be a true, but only if they are lowercase letters. If you want uppercase, you need to specify that. So for example, if we want any letter from A to Z, but it can be uppercase or lowercase, then that's what you would do. If it's from A to Z, comma, or capital A to capital Z, because they treat it very differently. Or what happens if we want just the vowels? Well, there's no way to write that in an order with, a, with two dots, so you can list them individually with commas. So if it's an A or an E or an R or an O or a U. So that's what you can do. Instead of saying if C letter equals A or if C letter equals E. So that's a lot better way of doing sets. Let's go look at sets over here. So if we click on this button, we're just going to get the value thing from rnum1. Get rnum1, and we're going to check if rnum1 is in the set from 40 to 50, then say, hey, you qualify for a retest because you didn't do, you failed, but you didn't do too badly. We'll give you another chance. So let's have a look at how that works if we run it. So if we take rnum1, which I think is this value, if it's 56, then it won't do anything because it's not in the range. See, it does nothing. Because it's not in the range from 40 to 45. I'm um, 40 to 50, sorry. But if I make it a 45, that is one of the options in that set. See, now you qualify for a retest. And that includes the actual lower and upper options, the 40 and the 40 and the 50. So you see 40 also qualifies, but if I make it 39, no, you don't qualify. But if I make it 50, yes, you do qualify. So there we go. So there's a way to use sets. And so here's an example if you're using, there's a character variable. So a character variable is just one particular letter. So that's how you would use a character, S letter equals to quote whatever that letter is. And if that letter is in that range, you can show a message, it's a valid class. So that's an example of a char variable, which is also ordinal type. That was part two of our video series on selective program. For the other videos, go to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, Follow us on Twitter. Give us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, don't do it the long way. Do it the Mr. Long.